Welcome to 21 Portland Place, the headquarters of the Association of Anaesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland. And with me today I have Dr. David Goldhill, a consultant anaesthetist from the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital in Stanmore, who is the chairman of the working party that has produced the latest Association of Anaesthetists safety guideline on inter-hospital transfers. David, hello. Morning. David, it, I get the impression that there's an awful lot more transferring going on these days than when I was a trainee. Is, th is this true or is this just an impression we have? Well, it's probably true, although there's relatively little evidence to support this. Um, my interests largely come from the critical care side of things and my involvement through the intensive care society. But certainly in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was quite an enormous growth in transfers between intensive care units and from emergency departments to intensive care units. And many of these transfers were for non-clinical reasons because of lack of critical care beds. David, the equipment necessary for transfer, and I have clear recollections from my training in the dim and distant past that I would take a patient into an ambulance that was wholly inadequately equipped to actually be able to manage that transfer. If you're transferring a critically ill patient, which is the better of the two options, that you have a travelling kit that includes all the monitoring equipment that you require, or that the transferring ambulance has that kit? Um, and whichever is the solution, how do you get to that? Do you have to liaise closely with the London Ambulance Service or whichever is the local ambulance service? Or should there be a national standard? Well, at the moment, I know the situation in London, and if you get an ambulance from the London Ambulance Service, it will not have all the equipment and facilities that you need to safely transfer somebody. Uh, and for example, it doesn't have 240 volt power supply, and the transfer trolley is totally inadequate. Now, transfer networks have been formed in many areas and this is one way in which equipment and protocols are being standardized and that's one solution that seems to work quite well uh, the alternative may well be to have a dedicated transfer service and that will have all the appropriate equipment but there's no doubt that the situation that we have at the moment in most areas is entirely unsatisfactory Against this backdrop is the uh, final enactment in August 2009 of the Working Time Directive where trainees will be reduced to the final working time of no more than 48 hours in a week. This is a fairly rich mixture, isn't it, of an increasing need for transfers and a decreasing availability of trainees. What sort of solutions would you offer for this? Well, I, I think it's very important that transfers are taken very seriously. Uh, the patients are in a vulnerable situation. It's a noisy, dangerous and isolated environment. And I think you identify a particular problem because most of the competencies that are required for transfer at the moment are held by intensivists and by uh, anaesthetists. And it's very important that if we perform transfers that we do not take people away from their other work uh, and uh, take them off onto transfers, which can often take place at short notice and take them out of the hospital for quite a long period of time. Now, David, I'm going to cut in there. and You, you mentioned two very important things, one of which was competencies for transfer. Has anybody written down a list of the necessary competencies for the transfer of a critically ill patient? Well there are certain documents including those produced by the college that do have a list of the competencies that are required and there is a debate about whether these are competencies that uh, are only within the remit of doctors or whether other staff uh, specially trained transfer staff, paramedics, nurses and so on can actually do the, the transfers. I mean there certainly is in a lot of hospitals in this country an automatic assumption that the person who should do the transfer is the anaesthetist and usually the anaesthetist uh, ST1 or ST2. 
Surely a critically ill patient should be accompanied by somebody who is capable of maintaining and securing an airway and manipulating the circulation. And isn't that only an anaesthetist or an intensivist? Well, uh, we do say that transfers should be undertaken by senior staff, preferably those that are trained and certainly those that are experienced. And the ev evidence at the moment suggests that uh, although that happens more, almost certainly more than it used to in the past, uh, it's still probably not common enough. And there is a debate as to which staff should actually be involved in these transfers, whether there should be a dedicated transfer service, and that certainly has some merit, and whether staff other than doctors, and certainly other than anaesthetists and intensivists, should actually do these transfers. Now you mentioned something of uh, great interest to the Association of Anaesthetists, which is the concept of a transfer service. Uh, for all the reasons that you very clearly outlined, this would be very appealing to anaesthetists and intensivists who have primarily the service in their own hospital as their focus. Who should, do you, first of all, do you think that transfer service should be created and should be widespread? And the second question is, who should be responsible for establishing it and running it and making sure that it has the correct equipment and the correct personnel? Well, transfer services are attractive in many ways and there are certainly models in Europe uh, where transfer services do exist. Uh, the document does not specifically uh, advocate transfer services as the only solution. If you have transfer services, then there are going to be transfers uh, that are time critical, for example those with uh, head injuries or burns, where trans service, transfer service may not always be able to respond in the appropriate time. And if you have a transfer vehicle and staff out doing a call, then they're not available to do a transfer that is, uh, is needed at short notice. So a transfer service is not the answer to all patients, but it certainly is something that can provide the proper expertise, the vehicles, the staff and equipment, uh, and certainly uh, is something that needs to be closely looked at. Now, unpleasant as it may be to consider this such an eventuality, it's not uncommon for ambulances to crash during transfer and the, those within the ambulance to sustain injury. Um, is there any sort of insurance that you can get for the trainee or the consultant transferring a patient? Because I understand the insurance of the hospitals are individuals of the hospital, but there's a sort of a grey area during transfer. Well, one of the things that we uh, talk about in the document is the important importance of the staff undertaking the transfers to have adequate insurance cover. Members of the Association uh, of Anaesthetists and indeed the Intensive Care Society are on an insurance scheme that will cover them for transfers. Uh, but it's very important that anyone undertaking a transfer is aware of what cover they have and clearly hospitals have responsibility uh, in this area as well. Uh, David. Could you pick for me the three most important aspects of the development of the transfer process between hospitals in the United Kingdom? I think we'd all agree that it's not ideal at the moment. I think we'd agree that it will take some time to achieve an ideal situation. But can you just choose three particular areas that you think are the most important? I think the first thing is to minimise the number of transfers that take place for non-clinical reasons. The second point is safety, not only for the patient being transferred, but it's very important that if personnel go from the transferring hospital, they do not jeopardize the care and the safety of the patients that are left behind. And the third point is to improve the documentation, the training, and the equipment for those involved in transfers. Um, David, thank you very much indeed um, for not only chairing the working party that produced this important AAGBI safety guideline, but also joining me today and talking about the new safety guideline which is published this week. And it's uh, 
A copy will be sent to every member of the Association of Anaesthetists, but it's also available as a PDF version from the Association's website, www.aagbi.org. David, thank you very much. Pleasure. Do anything for a cup of tea and a biscuit.